Being able to change your plan in the middle of a hand is what makes some of the great players elite. Davide Katai is definitely one of those guys who can be considered elite, maybe a top 10 tournament player in the world. In this hand, he has to change his plan mid-hand, and he makes some pretty incredible decisions. Yeah, uh, he's heads up for the EPT Berlin title in 2012 against Andrew Chen. Now, also, before we get to the hand, we want to make sure you know that the main event of the World Series final table is coming up. It's going to be live on ESPN, and we're going to be live tweeting that thing all the way through from beginning to end. So check it out on your Twitter machine. Make sure you follow us before that, and you'll get to hear our awesome, super cool insights. I mean, come on. Right. Also, this hand was suggested to us by Thomas Doring and Chris Leslie Heinen. If you want to suggest a hand, tweet it at us. Hashtag EPT Berlin. Blinds are up to 80 and 160,000 with a 20,000 ante. Andrew Chen, first to speak. Suited one gapper on the button, heads up. Raises to 360. This is not a mandatory three bet. Good way to balance your range. Tight. Alex to call. Jack 7 5 flop. Ace high still good. Tie checks. Checking to the pre flop aggressor. Chen should continue. He does. 330,000. Ace high will often be the best hand. Just like it is on this hand. Tie calls. Nine of spades on the turn. Changes nothing. Katai checks a second time. See if Chen slows down as well. He does. He checks behind. It's a little bit interesting that Chen decides to check here because he's got sort of the worst hand he could ever have and a hand that he knows is never good at all. Usually when people check, they're going to have uh, showdownable hands, although it's the turn, so it's a little bit different. But I think it really makes sense, too, because of the board. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't think on the turn Chen is checking because he has some plan for the river. Right. I think he's mostly checking to give up. He got called. The pot's not that big. The nine hits a ton of both of their ranges, but Chen knows that he has four high. So Katai is probably ahead. And this is a card that Katai is probably not folding on if it improved him. Katai can have hands like eight, nine, nine, ten. Jack nine even is in Katai's range, which of course he's never folding on the turn. I mean, eight, ten is in his range as well. There's just a bunch of stuff. The nine seems to hit almost all of it. I actually think this is a very reasonable and good check by right. Chen. Right. Going back to the flop, uh, Katai's range is a lot stronger than Chen's because Chen is doing this with any two cards, right? He mm -hmm. he raised pre-flop and he's c-betting on the flop. That could be really anything. Katai, in most situations, is going to have at least something that could win in the end when he calls on the flop. Right. Ace high being near the bottom of his range, which is what Katai's actual holding is. Ten of clubs on the river. You would expect it to go check, check, maybe check bluff here. But it looks like we're going to see a bet from Davide Katai. Is this a value bet or a bluff? Pretty sure he doesn't want to call, so I'm guessing this is a bluff to try to fold out a seven or a five. Chen should be ditching this right about now. But he's not. I know he's not calling. Well, this is certainly a bluff. A raise to more than 1.5 million. To be perfectly honest, there are tons of hands Andrew could have here that have ace three beat. Tons. Katai is not taking his gaze off Chen at all. It's like me with a chubby redhead. This would be some kind of absolute sick soul read. Awesome call alert! Awesome call is right, James Hardigan. That is an awesome call. So Andrew Chen, I said on the turn, was checking to give up a lot of the time. That was probably true. 
But now the river action has changed that thought process for him because it's an extremely polarizing river card, putting four to a straight out there. And then Katai bets into him, which polarizes Katai's range. It makes Chen think that he has an opportunity to win the pot that maybe he didn't have before. Yeah, Katai never, pretty much never has one pair here. He might be betting two pairs sometimes for value, hoping to get called by a hero call. Um, but Chen just feels like he's just not going to get called by anything worse than an eight most of the time anyway, and it's going to work out really well. Right, Chen can very reasonably represent an 8. But yeah. before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about what Katai is targeting when he bets his ace high initially. Yeah. Because let's be clear, when he bets, it's for it's not for value, it's as a bluff. For sure, it's for a bluff. He's tr essentially targeting all the millions of hands that are better than his that Chen checked back on the turn, which is ace-queen, ace-king. Ace-six is a chop now, but he doesn't want to chop it if he doesn't have to. Sevens, fives, pocket sixes, pocket fours pocket deuces um sometimes by the way a nine or a ten is gonna fold on the river as well maybe a jack even it's maybe but uh those are possible folds but what katai really reasonably expects chen to fold is probably all the under pairs to the board and anything with a five or a seven in it yeah five or seven which makes the most sense um that he bet the flop check back the turn um you're often gonna put him on a five or a seven not right. always but that's gonna be a, a big chunk of his holdings so katai is targeting is not successful because Chen <laughs> decides that four high is not good enough to win the pot. And he's right he's about right. that. Four high is behind. Chen raises, representing essentially an eight or better. Mm -hmm. Chen never has two pair here. Yeah. So what is Chen targeting when Chen raises to try to get Katai off of? I think it's got to be two pair almost always. Uh, not, I mean, he's not trying to get him off an eight. He knows Katai is never going to fold an eight. But... And, and Katai is rarely going to turn one pair into a bluff on the river. I think he's going to check it most of the time. But two pair, he really might be betting for value here. Right. Katai can have any two pair based on the way the action went. Mm -hmm. uh, the turn, he could have been hoping that Chen continued if he made jacks up with jack nine or something like that. He could easily have seven, nine, seven, ten, nine, ten, any of those hands. Absolutely. And decide that Chen's going to check back far too often. There's too much value in two pair to just check here and let the pot go check, check. So Chen is hoping that Katai has a hand like that going for thin-ish value, and that he then has to fold, because usually when a player is going to bet marginal hands like 9-10 here, they're doing it as a bet fold spot, because they know they're usually only getting raised by an 8 or better. Right. Now, the interesting thing that happens, of course, is Katai gets raised and starts to think, well, what can this guy really be raising me with anyway? I mean, he's not going to raise two pair. I don't think he's going to raise a set. He's essentially raising a straight or nothing, and Katai decides that even all of Chen's bluffs, Chen doesn't even have, like, um, bottom pair and is turning into a bluff or a big time ace high is turning into a bluff he thinks he's beating pretty much all of chen's bluffs somehow right which is crazy it's yeah. crazy that K katai can figure this out and the really cool thing about what katai does here is he's clearly betting as a bluff with ace high and he expects if he gets called he's just gonna be like oh i guess i lose you call For you. sure of course i lose always but then chen raises and Chen's range is obviously far more polarized when he raised than if chen were just to call yeah and katai then begins thinking about it. he's like wait He's raising? He can't really have that many hands now, can he? Can right. I beat a lot of his bluffs? And he can beat four deuce, obviously. <laughs> That's why. I mean, the, the problem for Katai here is that he can only really beat, like, the two undercards or maybe some weird random king high that somehow got here this way. Yeah, and I mean, there's not much. The, the other thing that's odd is that Katai decides to call instead of re-raise. And Joe acts like it's really normal that you would call here. But, like, I think most players who would decide to continue on with their ace three might click it back rather than call on the off chance that they are indeed beat by a terrible hand. Right. The problem with doing that for Katai is that he then is representing even better than an eight if he puts in a three bet here. He's not mm -hmm. expecting to get a call from anything really other than another eight if he wants to chop the pot if he three bets. So he can't be three betting for value without, without queen eight or better. Which is oh, a bit of a problem for three betting here. No, for sure, for sure. King, he could have king queen or um or queen eight. That would be right. It. He'd be representing extreme massive super nut strength, and the combos would be very thin. I agree, but at the same point, if he's saying I don't think Chen has you know much of a hand very often, but you just can't beat almost any of even of his bluffs. I would think, although it turns out that's not the case here. Right, and we speculated in the podcast that it's possible that when Chen was making his decision on whether to raise or to fold on the river, Katai picked something up on Chen that yeah. showed Katai that Chen was never considering calling. And through that, 
Katai took fives and sevens out of Chen's raising as a bluff range and yes. then decided, okay, he doesn't have a five or a seven because he never even contemplated calling. He was only raising or folding. Right. Therefore, he's polarized. Right. And you could actually, if, if he's not going to contemplate calling with a five, he's probably not contemplating calling with a ace queen or ace king in the same way because it's sort of the same hand, really, a five or ace king. So that takes all the better ace highs out too. Now, understand David Katai is the master reader of souls. Yes, like he is. Like the true reader of souls, not your Phil Hellmuth or even your Daniel Negreanu. This guy is the man. So I think that plays into it too, for sure. Right. Either way, it's an incredible call. Um, I don't think I'm capable of doing that. No. At all. I don't know who is. David Katai is. There you go. It's, one, it's a list of one. Stick around because after this, we're going to look at viewer comments from last week's video. If you guys want to see another elite David Katai play, check out How Do You Call by clicking here. So elite. <laughs> also check out our podcast and make sure you subscribe to this video production. Last week we had a super cool hand between Jonathan Duhamel and Tobias Rankenmeyer where Tobias turned an overpair into a bluff on a super scary board and ended up winning the hand where he really shouldn't be able to except that he's just so good. Yeah, it was especially interesting because there was four to a straight on the board and Duhamel, Jonathan, ex-world champion, um, had a straight and he bet about a third of the pot into Tobias. Tobias just raised big and won with the overpair representing the flush and it worked. Do Hummel fold it. It was hyper elite. Yeah, it was big time. Let's see what you had to say about it. And by you, I mean the collective you, of course. <laughs> All right, so on YouTube, Max Lacerda says, about the river bet, if Do Hummel isn't calling a raise, I don't see a good reason to bet. The board is so wet that I think it's better to check, call, and control the size of the pot. Right, so this may be correct, but also at the same time, I think Max might be falling into something that we are often accused of and sometimes culpable for, which is being a bit results oriented. Yeah. We see it play out like this and you think, well, why could you, why would you ever bet when you're just going to fold to a raise? DeHommel was thinking he just needs to get value from his hand. He can't let it go check, check because his hand has improved so much to a straight. And he assumes that his opponent, Tobias, even though he's super elite, isn't going to raise without a flush. So yeah. he can be kind of unexploitable. Uh, at the same time, he gets exploited because Tobias just makes such an above the rim play. Yeah, against almost everybody, by betting here, you're going to make more money over the long haul, I think, than by check calling here because so often it's going to go check, check on a three flush, four straight board. Um, usually you bet about a third of the pot, you're going to get called by the two pairs and the sets and things like that and almost never get raised. And as Grant said, when you get raised, it's almost always by a real hand. Just Tobias is too good. Right. That being said, uh, of course, Jonathan, in his head at the time, Jonathan Duhamel, was thinking, why didn't I just check? Oh, like, yeah. Of course, that's what he was thinking. The moment the, moment the race came out. And that happens to all of us, of course, right? Mm -hmm. um, on Reddit, Gutsy Bible said, Gusty Bible. Oh, is it said, Guts? It's Gusty. Gusty, Gusty Bible. I thought it was Gutsy. They're both good names. <laughs> He's, he says, uh, or she, maybe I'm thinking too hard about this, but if according to the video, that's us, we're the video, <laughs> Duhamel caps his range on the turn and Rankemeyer Rank uncaps his, then why wouldn't Duhamel be able to credit Tobias with a larger range than simply made flushes on the river? Which is what he has to do in order to fold a near nut straight while getting 4-1 to on a call. Well, the thing is this. It's a good question, um, Gusty. But the thing is that, yes, he's got an uncapped range, but it's only uncapped at the top. The rest of it is the same. So the bluffs that were the bluffs are still the bluffs. But, the, um, but since Tobias can have the nuts and flushes, when if he had checked it back, it's much harder for him to, that actually um, elongates his value range. Right, on top of that, uh, at the time that you're referring to when we made the comment about Tobias's range being uncapped on the turn, the hand progressed and the river occurred and Tobias's value range became much thinner. Yeah. Uh, in a standard spot, he would only be raising a flush here. And that's why he generally can represent a flush and not really anything else for value. Yeah, and I think ultimately why do Hamel folds probably correctly, even though it sucked. Right. Anyway, thanks for the comments, and we'll see you guys next week. Indeed.